Don't you ever take for granted the privilege of getting to go to church. That's under attack. There is a reproach that comes with being a follower of Christ. We in America have tried to reshape the whole church so that it's palatable and likable in the culture. A church that is accepted well with the culture is usually not accepted well with Christ. The church is a fortress, and a fortress is strength. A fortress is might. Not only a center of defense, but a place of strategic planning and offense. Our God does not expect us to wait for the darkness to enclose around us. He expects us to take up His banner and fight the darkness with His light. You want to know what the biggest problem with America is? The wolf is this country. Gave in. Gave in to public pressure. Gave in to political correctness. One of the greatest curses this country has ever had to deal with is political correctness. Preparing the Christian to shine the light against the darkness of this world. Welcome to Our Mighty Fortress Podcast. I'm your host, Ron Miller, and welcome to the show. We have an important subject to cover today, but first, please go ahead and hit that follow or subscribe button on the podcast platform in which you're listening to us upon. We have several social media platforms with all sorts of material that you can listen to and read. Check out our fan page when you type in the Facebook search bar at Our Mighty Fortress. You can also visit our website, OurMightyFortress.com. We have a host of media there. We have articles and videos and even access to our merch store to help support our work. If you do feel so motivated to donate to the work that we do here, feel free to do so through our website in the established PayPal link. If we've helped you in some way through our work, I'd like to hear about it. Please tell us at OurMightyFortress at gmail.com. By following and supporting the podcast, you let me know that you care about the subjects that we discuss. Today, I'd like to talk about one of the most important subjects that can ever be answered. I want to share with you some simple principles about how to study your Bible. I want to take this podcast to help you develop and grow, not only in your faith, but to help you know how to search for truth. For those who may already have somewhat of an understanding of this already, I'd like to leave you with maybe some more advanced types of study that may help you too. I'd like to illustrate various events that took place in my life even, and they greatly helped me in my Christian development. And they're pretty relevant to our study. We'll talk about those later. Not that I'm anything special, but anybody who's done the work of God, they got stories. And, well, I'm just going to try to illustrate how biblical study actually comes into practice. First, we're going to look at the importance of the subject and why it's greatly needed. I want to be able to emphasize the need for a deep biblical study. Then we're going to take a look at various principles I use with in-depth studies that I've taken on. Maybe some of the ways that I go about it might slightly vary from yours, but that's okay. We can all learn new techniques and concepts to help us begin our search out of the riches of Christ. I would like to then conclude with some guiding principles for advanced study because there are stumbling blocks for people who are not weary. I want to emphasize again, that's not my way or the highway, but take what you can use at the moment. Maybe we're going to talk about things that aren't quite relevant to you at the moment, but you might use it later. Keep an open mind as we learn how to study the Word of God. With that introduction, let's get right into this. I want to start with a verse from the Bible that we should take very seriously. I will reference several scriptures throughout, but this one really sums up what the Christian should be aiming for in their Bible study. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 15, it says, quote, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. End quote. What is this saying? This is telling us that God expects us to study the word of God and not to be ashamed about doing it. This is going to help us 
rightly divide the word of truth or interpret its meaning. What does it mean to not be ashamed in this context? There are plenty of subjects that the heathen of this world will try to make Christians feel foolish about believing. What am I talking about? Well, let me give an example. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul astounds the wise men of the city of Athens at a place called Mars Hill. Many of the Greek philosophers thought that the resurrection of the dead was foolishness and they mocked Paul. This is very much like today when you try to tell people that Jesus was not only crucified and buried but rose again from the dead on the third day. Same thing happens today. Another subject that causes Christians to be ashamed is the six day literal creation of God in the book of Genesis. A lot of Christians shy away from that topic. There are many subjects like that, but I think you get the point. The Apostle Paul was an educated man, and he not only studied the ways of the Greeks, but he also studied the depth of scriptures. He reasoned with people from the scriptures itself, despite his knowledge. That's important to note. I also want to share this important point before we begin our journey in studying and understanding the Word of God. In our modern culture, Christians have set aside this great calling of God, and they have deferred to only knowing the world's knowledge. So many Christians could be classified as biblically illiterate, and really, there's too many that are just so lazy to know what the Word of God says because they don't pick up the book and read it. We see it on social media platforms and the cheesy slash lame motivational posts that go around. You know, pastors that would rather give some sort of motivational quote from some secular book they read rather than from the Word of God and the encouragement that it provides. God wants his children to study and learn more about him. But look, this is a lifelong process, and you're never going to achieve some sort of maximum knowledge with God. There was so much to learn. If I were to ask you, for instance, what it means to be saved, would you be able to explain it clearly from Scripture? Not just to say it in a few brief words, but to describe it and show in Scripture where it's at. How about another one? How does the death, the burial, and resurrection work out with God's uh, scheme of time in reference to Jesus, of course? In fact, what if I asked you to explain why, you, why you're a Christian instead of a Buddhist or a Muslim? Would you be able to do it clearly? How familiar are you with the different doctrines that the Bible teaches? It's important to know that your knowledge of the Bible shouldn't just come from what you hear from somebody else. It was the great theologian Lewis Schaefer that once said, quote, no student of the scriptures should be satisfied to traffic only in the results of the study of other men, end quote. What is he saying? What we take in and what we learn just shouldn't be from somebody else. We should be able to study it ourselves. We shouldn't just be parrots. We should know what we believe and why we believe it. Not because some pastor or theologian says so, but that you can show it from the word of God as being truth. Social media, of course, can be a blessing, but it's also a curse at times because it does provide a platform for a lot of confusion, and it can be very hard in determining truth. False teaching from the Bible is pretty rampant on platforms like YouTube and, and those types of things. These YouTube false prophets will persuade many to what the Bible says their damnable heresy. The book of Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 1 says, quote, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be pro false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. End quote. Look, even in the apostles' day, there were people that came along trying to bring these damnable heresies into the church. The same thing happens today. We must know what we believe, and why we believe it. 
This is about the basic fundamental truths of the Christian faith. I repeat this again because so many go astray in their study of God's word because they get enamored with some teacher that ends up being a false prophet. Too many are willing just to say, watch a two minute YouTube video and they think they've studied. They don't want to take on the hard work of studying the word of God. We have now set that foundation. So where do we start our study? We have to start with the book of James in chapter one and verse five, when it says, quote, if any of you lack wisdom, let a mask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given to him, end quote. Now I can personally attest to this actually, because this scripture was shown very real to me when I first got saved. I first got saved in 2008, it was about March time frame. And I think it was about a Thursday night. That following weekend, I even got baptized. Now, the following Saturday after that, I remember talking to a friend of mine. And we were talking about evolution and what how that compares with the Bible. And I didn't really know much to say about that because I was... I trusted Christ by faith and I stepped out and I didn't know about all those comparisons. And so I didn't really say much, but I remember thinking to myself, Hmm, I wonder about that. So I remember it was a Saturday night praying to God that, Hey, you know, could you please help me understand this? Is this something that you used or is this false or, or what, what is this all about? And remember I, I had nothing I had no dog in this fight or whatever. I was still a brand new Christian trying to figure everything out. Well, the very next day I came into church <laughs> and I'll never forget the pastor got up and talked about a college class that they were offering about the study of the, uh, of creation versus evolution. Now, mind you, I hadn't told anybody about this. So I remember just giggling like a little girl here. I was in the Marine Corps. I was giggling like a little girl in the congregation. And I looked up at the ceiling, and I, like I was looking at God or something. Right. And I was like, Oh, you crazy guy. Like I said, I was a new Christian. I didn't expect to have my prayer answered. God answered my prayer by giving me the ability and the means by which I can learn this subject. God answered my prayer. God alone is the source of wisdom and knowledge, as it says in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. Now, I find this so awesome because when you want to learn something, God, and you ask God about it, God will provide the means for you to be able to learn it. But, you know, too many people in Christianity get majorly disrupted and messed up because they fail to start their study properly. They fail to start with God. Since we've started off on the right foot with asking God, let's say you're looking at a few passages of scriptures that you're trying to understand. There are four basic rules when trying to interpret scripture. And if you follow them, you'll end up with the right meaning. They're as follows. Number one, what is the grammar? Like for instance, are you reading the passage correctly? I always use the joke, let's eat grandpa or let's eat grandpa. A comma saves grandpa's life. <laughs> so grammar does matter. How about the textual context? What is the passage describing or talking about? What does it say before that or after that? What is the historical context? What's taking place in history at the moment? Because that kind of tells you a little bit about what's happening when God's interacting with somebody in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. That really, really helps. How about the cultural context? Does the passage refer to anything specific uh, with some culture of the day in which it was written? Those four simple rules really lay the guidelines and kind of the barriers by which you interpret Scripture. And those words are very loaded. Don't get me wrong. Like, for instance, if you're going to read historical context, well, sometimes it can be lengthy. Um, maybe the grammar is a kind of a short study. It's kind of as is if you know your grammar. But ultimately, if you stay within those guidelines, you're perfectly fine. If you happen to know of or adhere to, say, certain theological systems, you have to be able to set those aside and don't let them cloud your judgment as you read Scripture. The meaning 
is read to us, not reading the meaning into the text. This is very, very, very important. And I say that because this is very, very common. It is common. I mean, you have theological systems, whether it's Calvinism or Arminianism or dispensationalism or covenant theology, or there are so many different systems that can often cloud biblical interpretation. If you don't what know any of those types or systems, uh, that's okay, because I mean, you come to scripture with a heart and mind ready to learn. It's very important to not come to the scriptures with your own pre preconceptions. Also, when you read a passage of scripture, there are some important questions to ask. Is there an important doctrine being described? Alongside with that, are there important words that are used that you may need to highlight for meaning? Is the topic that you're studying found in the Old Testament or the New Testament? Or uh, that topic is talked about in both because that can matter. When studying a specific topic, once again, once again, preconceptions you have to leave behind. Otherwise, you'll just find something that you already know and believe. You'll find, you'll, basically what I mean by that is that you'll bring your preconceptions to the table and you'll just prove what you already believe, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you actually brought out the true meaning of the text. It happens more often than not. It is actually kind of hard to do, but you just have to keep your mind and heart ready to be changed if the evidence suggests that, well, your initial interpretation might be wrong. God always makes himself known and has nothing to hide because he is the author of wisdom. Let him speak to you. That's very important. I do have to make a very special note here on this. God is the author of wisdom, but he's not just going to download it into your head. <laughs> Some people just seem to believe that. He's going to enlighten you to areas of scripture or even outside resources that we know about biblical subjects. There are many in the Christian realm that may disagree with what I said, but when God said that he would use the Holy Spirit to guide us to all truth, it wasn't to spoon feed us, okay? He expects us to do our parts in our study. Take that step forward and he will guide you to truth. If it was just as easy as some sort of holy download of information, then we wouldn't need language school to be missionaries on a foreign field or similar examples. God built scripture to be cross-referenced across history itself. You can pick up a history book, for instance, and learn about ancient cultures that the scriptures talk about. There is much to say on this, but ultimately, don't be afraid of outside knowledge because guess what? God isn't. Moving on from that, remember what I said about social media and the internet and how caution has to be used? When utilizing the internet with the almost unlimited amount of information that can be found on any given topic, you can be sure that probably at least half may be inaccurate or just blatantly wrong. When internet browsing in your study, if you find something interesting, then it's always good to cross-reference it. If it's true, it will be cross-referenced by multiple sources, multiple independent sources. And guess what? It's still going to follow along the plan of God and scripture. Just be careful of gaining your information from various websites on the internet. There's a lot of trash out there that you don't need to infect your mind with. And there's a lot of cults too, for heaven's sakes. There's people who will say, well, God has shown me some sort of information that nobody else has. Well, that's about as clear sign as it gets as being cultic. Believe it or not, this actually happens. I've known somebody who got caught up in that. It's, it's utter stupidity. In your study, you can use biblical commentaries to help you along, but keep in mind that commentators will always be coming from a certain point of view. Good commentaries can be quite helpful at times when you're using the above principles. But remember, if the scripture is silent on something and not getting super specific, then we should be silent. 
It's okay to ponder various ideas, but don't make it doctrine. There is wisdom with gleaning from men of God that came before you. And this is the precedent throughout all of Scripture, actually. God does this, uh, how knowledge is attained and, and builds up over time, especially with the prophets. So there's nothing wrong with reading about what other men and even women of God have written in the past. You can learn something. So maybe something God showed them, maybe some sort of event that God used in their life to bring forth uh, his glory. I mean, there's lots of missionary stories that are very similar to this. When you're looking at various Christian doctrines, for instance, you can even look up some of the early church fathers and what they had to say about the topic. I would say more like the Ananicene fathers. When you get into the later volumes, then it gets a little weird. But in the earlier volumes, you have Justin Martyr, Arrhenius, Tertullian. They have some pretty interesting things to say, and they're pretty close to the apostles, and so you may be able to get some good insight. They do have some good things to say. Speaking of books... Well, that can help you further your study on a particular topic, but it can be quite a headache sometimes because you have to put time in researching uh, the study and the books and the authors. You're going to be you know, taking time to read and especially money to buy the book. What point of view is the author of the book coming from? Is he for, in the middle, or against the topic that you're studying? Are there book reviews? What do they say? Uh, this can be quite the tedious part of your time. I tend to, before I buy a book, I would read the reviews about what people had to say so I don't waste my money. I, I am an avid reader and I have a large library in my house of just various different subjects, but <laughs> I do pick and choose my books. Read the good reviews, but also read the bad reviews and don't settle for short answers like, this book is lousy <laughs> or this book is great, but why? Some people take time to actually write those. In fact, I think it's actually a job where you can get paid to write uh, reviews. That's kind of funny, actually. Where is the source of the information coming from about, about the book? What do I mean? Is the book a primary source, which are records produced at the time or by the person or people that you're studying? Or are they secondary sources, which are records written about primary sources? Secondary sources, though not all, can be confusing sometimes due to you know differing biases of the writers with some subjects this can be kind of a big deal with the information that's given and you're going to have to verify the information anyways remember the important thing here is to always cross-reference information i love watching documentaries i'm just that kind of person but i always cross-reference information because just because somebody puts together a documentary doesn't mean it's actually correct it sounds like an oxymoron but it is what it is. You can also do word studies that involve Greek and Hebrew words used in the original languages of the Bible. There are many in the Christian realm that do put too much emphasis on this, but the truth of the matter is that simple definitions and grammar can be more helpful in, uh, rather than trying to look it up in Greek and Hebrew. Um, so just you can stick with the English translation for the most part. I can tell you personally from having four years of biblical Greek and two years of biblical Hebrew, I mean, it's cool to know your way around the language, but if you don't, that's perfectly okay. It's not like you're massively missing out. There are great subjects actually to study when it comes to why God used certain words over others when he uh, penned his word. I mean, that's some interesting studies, but overall, there are too many in the Christian realm that gloat on how they know Greek and Hebrew, but it really doesn't matter. The English version works out just fine for most. Now it's time to gather all of the evidence that you've acquired and take a look at the biblical verses in question and see if the evidence matches or doesn't match. If it isn't a fundamental doctrinal issue, it's always good to sit on an idea for a while because as time goes by, you may discover some information that may change your mind. Changing your beliefs about something shouldn't happen overnight. But remember, I'm not talking about fundamental Christian doctrine that's very clear in Scripture. For instance, like the mode of salvation through Jesus Christ. That doctrine is non-negotiable, as, as are others. I'm talking about side studies that you can take a look at or even... 
you know, various interpretations of things that maybe God doesn't specifically spell out. For instance, like how do rewards in heaven work out for Christians? You don't really know the details of that. And I think God does that purposely, actually. Or maybe how the demons operate in this world. There's very little information on that. We know certain principles, but not all the specific details. Or maybe how God used certain prophets over others. There are so many subjects. And people have varying opinions about these side topics, but they're still brethren and nobody's out of line with God, as long as they're not being an, an idiot about it or a heretic. <laughs> Another way to study is to deal with certain topics that you're interested in or maybe dealing with at the time. This could be something that affects you or another person. This type of study involves what is called practical theology, meaning this deals with everyday issues that may affect your daily walk with God. There are various temptations from drugs to alcohol, fornication, adultery, anger, pride, suicide, depression, and so much more. These are listed throughout the scriptures, where you can also study the positive aspects of walking with God, and those can be found through the fruit of the Spirit. You see that in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. There's a whole list of them there that you can study. You can also memorize scripture by category this way. As the book of Psalms 119 and verse 11 says, quote, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. End quote. Learning God's word and committing it to memory is actually pretty easy to do and is as simple as buying note cards to write scripture upon. You can learn to recite them by memory as you're going about your day. And it's a very effective way to put a lot of scripture um, and commit it to memory. I remember one man of God who once said, quote, If the Bible was taken away from you today by the enemies of God, how much of it would you have committed to memory? End quote. You know, when you think about that, that's very convicting. Because I think there's probably very few of us on the planet who have the entirety of God's word memorized, let alone enough if the Bible was actually taken away from us. I do fully believe that God reveals his word over time. And as history progresses, we have come to a much deeper understanding of the Bible. There were so many much to learn though and you're never going to learn everything that God has to say in his word but it's so much fun to learn more and more I will say this in a day of denominations galore it is the Baptists that stand out for being well studied in the word of God it was the Baptistic peoples of old that stood against the false teachings through history this is because the first and foremost authority is the word of God and not man's traditions or books. Reading widely is a very good thing and has biblical precedent. The Apostle Paul was a very educated man and he had knowledge of Grecian ways. He quoted such when he was at Athens in the book of Acts. In spite of all this though, before you read across the board, you need to have a solid foundation. And if you don't have scripture rolling off your tongue for various subjects, then you don't need to be reading other books referencing scripture. We talked about a lot. And there are many subjects and aspects that you may not be ready for, but that's okay. Glean from what you can and maybe you'll develop a system that helps you learn. We live in times where the world is in desperate need of Bible-believing Christians. They need Christians who know scripture. They need Christians who know what they believe and proclaim why they believe it. I want to thank you for listening. And be sure to follow us on the podcast media. Take a look at our website, OurMightyFortress.com, and subscribe for more updates. Stay tuned next time for more great content. And remember to find your refuge and strength in Our Mighty Fortress.